Joe Millis, and each week I'll bring you an inspiring person or message to help you discover how to break in and succeed in sports and life. Thanks for spending some time with me today and let the experience begin. This episode is brought to you by Sports Business Classroom, an immersive sports business training and educational experience dedicated to preparing future sports business professionals. It is a one of a kind learning opportunity for those interested in the business of basketball and jobs in sports. Sports Business Classroom combines the best of all worlds into a single package. Great academics, hands-on experience, immersion in the Las Vegas Summer League, and interaction with some of the best minds working in and around the NBA. For more information about Sports Business Classroom, go to sportsbusinessclassroom.com. This episode is also brought to you by Hall Pass Media, a full-service marketing agency that specializes in brand consulting, event management, digital marketing, and creative design. For more information on Hall Pass Media, go to hallpassnetwork.com. Today's guest is Shay Dawson, Director of Athlete and Community Relations for the incredibly popular sports network, Overtime. Prior to joining Overtime, Shay was the Manager of Player Programs and Team Services for the Philadelphia 76ers, a position where she frequently interacted with NBA superstars such as Ben Simmons, Joel Embiid, and Jimmy Butler. In this episode, we talk about what Shay calls the Shay Dawson experience, how she jumpstarted her career in the NBA, her year of yes, and how being intentional can lead to new opportunities. Without further ado, I give you the great Shay Dawson. Shay, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks for having me. I'm so excited. We're super, super excited to have you. So I wanted to start off with the fact that you got your first big break in pro sports at uh, the age of 30, which I think yes. is absolutely amazing. And if I'm not mistaken, this was what you called your year of yes. Yes. Can you walk us through where you were at in your life? What led you to commit to saying yes to everything at that point and where that all led you? Sure. So I was living in LA, uh, originally from San Diego. I had moved to LA right after college. Uh, because I knew that I wasn't going to play professional basketball and I knew I wanted to get a jump start on my career um, in sports. I knew I wanted to work in sports because I had done an internship um, at my college called Five Star Basketball, working in basketball operations. Mm -hmm. And then when I moved to L.A., I knew that I wanted to either coach or do something uh, with sports and basketball and volleyball because I played both in college. Uh, So I started coaching and uh teaching at a school, uh, called windward school. Okay. And then, uh, that catapulted me into a full-time position teaching at a different school. So I did part-time at windward and then full-time at turning point, coaching volleyball, teaching PE, it's kind of going back and forth. And windward is seven through 12 and turning point is two years old to eighth grade. So it was kind of like a feeder school. So it was good, uh, balance of like younger kids. And then, uh, at the high school level, it was windward. Um, And so I had been doing that, let's say about 10 years when I decided to, well, maybe like nine and a half before I decided to uh, try and make the jump to the NBA. But I didn't know how I was going to do that. I kind of was just helping my brother uh, with his career. Um, His name is Malcolm Thomas. He went to San Diego State Mm -hmm. and he uh, was entering the draft in 2011. They ended up having a lockout. So we had to go to Korea first. So I visited him for about two and a half weeks, saw what he was doing, kind of was taking notes. And then uh, after that, he kind of got on the NBA team. So I was kind of uh, helping him, trying to maneuver, figure out what he's going to do, which kind of agent he wanted, all that. I was helping him with that. And then he ended up getting uh, waived and going to Israel. Mm-hmm. So he played in Israel and that's where I met Liron Fanon and that's one of my best friends to today. And, uh, she was a major agent, a major player over in the overseas world, especially in Maccabi Tel Aviv. Her dad was huge there. Um, and we kind of hit it off. She was handling all of Malcolm's affairs, um, overseas. He also added, a. Uh, an agent in the, in the States as well, but really Ron took over everything. And so she must've took a liking to me and uh, loved my personality and saw how I was with Malcolm and with a lot of other players that I knew that actually happened to be playing in Israel at the time. Um, and she just liked, I guess, how I vibed with them, how, you know, they took to me and she told me, she said, you know what? I think you'd be great for uh, NBA summer league to intern there. And I'm like, sign me up like let me know she's like I don't know if it's possible but I'll call Warren uh Warren Laguerre 
love Warren and uh, we'll see what, what can happen. And then she ended up um, calling me back. And then I got an email from Rhoda saying that uh, send my resume and uh, I ended up getting in. But before that, I just realized that I knew I needed a change. And so that's why I was going overseas with my brother. That's why I was just doing everything. I was just saying, yes, I wasn't going to make any excuses why I couldn't go. If I had to work, I was going to take off. Uh, if I didn't have the money, I was going to save. I just decided to say yes to everything. And so start saying yes to that meeting Lerone. And after that, just saying yes, even though I was a 30 year old intern, I was nervous when I got that email. I didn't think that they would accept me. I didn't think that, uh, you know, I was right for the job only, even though I had been doing this for a while, I just thought, anyway, just don't worry about it. Shay, just say yes and see what happens. Um, I knew I'd be one of the oldest people there just as an intern. Turns out I wasn't, uh, there were maybe a few people that were my age, but you know, probably in leadership positions. So I didn't mind starting over again, especially learning something new and being in a new environment. Um, and then before that, sorry, before that, prior to that, I started to work all these camps that were in other states and they cost a lot of money. But I, like I said, I didn't say um, no. I just said yes. I even borrowed money from family, friends just to do this. And they knew that I was trying to uh, start something new in my career since I was coaching and teaching for a while and the college thing didn't work out. And I think just speaking to that is just like, if you're trying to do something positive, like, and you ask for help, people will help you. So that's kind of how I got started. Um, saying yes, just realizing that I got to combine my, um, my hustle and my grind mm -hmm. with speaking up and asking for help. And then, uh, once I got, um, into NBA summer league, I met you, I met Jake. Um, and we were talking one day and you guys were like, Shay, what do you want to do? And I was like, this is my second year as an intern. And I said, yeah, I think I want to work in the league. And then I remember you saying, okay, cool. And you and Jake, you know, you were talking and you must have told Albert, um, you know, I mean, I think I was doing a good job working hard too. So you when you told Albert job. that, yeah. he said, Shay, uh, meet me in, I guess, I forget what suite it was, like 20. And in there was uh, NBA executive. And I had my first informal interview. So That's fantastic. I want to go back to just the yes thing, okay? You saying yes to everything, having that positive attitude, knowing that if you say yes, things are going to work out. Yeah. Uh, where, where, where'd you get that from? So I remember, I want to say, I heard it either on Oprah or somewhere. Um, but I remember that Oprah had a program talking about uh, intentionality, Mm -hmm. And she had a guest on her show named Z Gary Zukov. And Gary Zukov, uh, he wrote a book called um, Seed of the Soul. And it was about just being intentional. And so I thought, wow, I don't think I'm being intentional enough in my life. And I need to change that. And so I started to say yes with the intention of making progress in my career and just even in my personal and my, and my romantic life. Um, I think I was more picky when it came to things like, oh, you know, this person doesn't do this, doesn't do that. But uh, even when, you know, people would ask me to go on dates, I said yes, just to see what it was like instead of to uh, block my own blessings. So I realized that that was kind of something that was a trend um, in order to like meet new people. And I even met a couple cool connects from there, people who asked me to like join on their events or help out and volunteer. Um, so I just started seeing a pattern just of what it, what it was like to say yes, instead of saying no and experiencing the same exact thing and not changing anything. That's amazing. And a great lesson for everybody listening, right? It's just say yes to as many things as you can, especially when you're young or trying to open up new opportunities so that you can, you can open doors. You never know what can happen when you, like you said, when you continue to say yes. So you, you did that for a whole year. You ended up at NBA Summer League, and now you're interviewing for your first NBA gig. Yes. Walk us through what that process kind of looked like. Uh, so I was very nervous, um, but I don't think that his name is Brandon Williams. He's He gave me a chance. He I don't think he sensed my, um, my nervousness, my anxiety, uh, just because, you know, being in front of a, a major NBA executive, especially when that's your dream, 
and I had decided that that was my dream once I started working summer league uh, the year before. Um, I was like, yeah, this is what I wanted to do because I had been working in all the elite camps, Pangos All American, Five Star. Um, I was working all the tournaments like Fab 48, which is now bit the big time tournament in Las Vegas. And a lot of the kids that were younger at the time had now been in the league. So I thought if I was helping them while they were younger, I could definitely do it while they were in the NBA. And so when I was in front of this guy, I just remembered to tell those stories. Um, when I was in front of Brandon, you know, he asked me, you know, which athletes were you close to and which athletes uh, influenced you? you know, to think that you can work in the NBA. And I thought about it and I was like, wow, I actually came in contact with some really great guys who I still keep in contact with today. Um, Paul George being one, met him in, when he was in high school and he was on his recruiting visit to Pepperdine, which is where my brother Malcolm was playing at the time. And uh, he, we were hosting him. And then we ended up staying friends and I ended up going to his high school games and just being supportive um, of him. And, and now, you know, seeing him as an all-star and, and such a superstar in the league is awesome. Another one is Isaiah Thomas, uh, Kenneth Fareed, who I met at Five Star in Honesdale, Pennsylvania, when he was 16. Uh, I met Isaiah Thomas through the draft process, driving them to and from the gym, making sure they eat, making sure they're doing this and that. So it's pretty cool. Um, and so I just started to tell him those stories about how uh, organically this kind of became something that I maybe knew I was supposed to be doing because I had done it in the past. And he kept asking me questions. He was intrigued by that. And uh, he said, actually, yeah, we're looking for a position of someone who can actually work with the athletes and player development, which is off court. So he's like, your stories translate. Uh, you know, how would you like to, you know, you know, to have a formal interview? So I said, Awesome. We went back our separate ways. Summer league was over. I went back to San Diego and my mom calls it. She calls it. I went into cave mode and cave mode is where I <laughs> stayed in her house for five days and I didn't do anything, didn't take any phone calls besides one phone call. And it was a guy, <laughs> a guy that I'm dating now. Um, but we really were just talking about how to execute um, this interview because I had never really done a formal interview. All the jobs I have gotten based off my personality and people being like, yeah, I think you're qualified. So I had to really research and prepare. Uh, I made a video, like a recruiting video with Russell Westbrook. Uh, we were recruiting him and I think we signed him to a five year deal for $160 million. And that was, it was a mock interview and I made that on iMovie. I love um, that. And I, that was like the project that I sent to him. And then I also showed him a deck from Pangos that Leslie, my friend, Leslie, who is the, um, She's the director there. She had made and we had been working on that for sponsorship. So I had to, he wanted me to show physical things that I had made and I really didn't have much. So I just kind of pulled stuff from everywhere just to try and show him that I was ready and I was serious about this. And then once we went through the process, you know, he asked me, did I have any questions? I asked him, uh, you know, about the culture. I asked him about why he uh, thought that I'd be a good fit, you know, when I had never had NBA experience. And he just said he liked my personality. He liked my drive and that, you know, I've had informal experience with players, but that he thinks that, you know, he can help me figure it out. So I was like, wow, that's, that's amazing. And I was appreciative. And then let's say after those five days, he gave me a call and offered me. And at first I didn't hear him. You know, I, I didn't really hear what he said, but he's like, Shay, we'd like to offer you a position with the 76ers. And I literally paused for 30 seconds and I muted the phone and I screamed and then I muted it back and I said, uh, I'm in. <laughs> that's so, amazing. That's, a, yeah. that's an incredible story. And so you moved from at the time you were living in L.A., was it? I was living in L.A., um, but I was in San Diego on summer break. Okay. And then, yeah. and so moving to Philly, were you, were you just in, were you scared? Like what were, what were the feelings associated with, you know, making that big of a transition? So I was so scared. I was so scared. But what happened was in my year of yes, I went on a date because I said yes. And mm -hmm. I ended up rekindling with a guy I met five years prior and he lived in Philly. And so I had t been talking to him through this whole process being like, you know, I'm interviewing, but we were just talking as friends, not, I wasn't thinking that he, I was going to end up dating him. Um, and he'd be my boyfriend today. But, uh, you know, we went on that date. We, we, um, had a great talk about career and what we wanted to do. And then when I got the job in Philly, I called him and I said, Oh my God, you will not believe it. I'm moving to Philly. And so he said, say no more. Uh, he sent his friend to pick me up from the airport. 
he already had all the apartments picked out that he thought I would like based on our conversations. So he made it easy for me in terms of the transition. He vetted everything. And then from there, I was like, wow, this guy really took the time to think about me and to help me get acclimated to the city. And if it wasn't for him, you know, I think it would have been a little bit tougher, but it was kind of like the universe was just giving me all these cool signs. Um, no and everything was just working out how it was supposed to. And I moved into a wonderful apartment, my first apartment by myself, um, that he helped me pick out and we kind of tag team, you know, he would, um, help me just like, this is where you should go for shopping. I know you like to be kind of in the suburbs cause I like to drive my car, which is not allowed really, or not, not, it's not allowed, but no people really drive in Philly, you know, they either walk or take public transportation. So I would drive in New Jersey to my favorite stores. And I come back in Philly and, you know, he'd show me different parts how and in Philly, there's like different barriers where it looks like it's in Philly, but if you can cross the street, it's not. And I'm like, what? That's crazy. So he kind of showed me around and, and kind of got me settled in. So all because of being intentional in the year of yes. In the year of yes, got found. I found love and I found my dream job with just saying yes. I love that. Yeah, I love that. And so okay, what was your, your first title with the 76ers? It is manager of player programs and team services. Yeah. What did you do on a day to day? Yeah. So I was under the player development umbrella. Um, that was my department. Mm -hmm. And so on a day to day, it was never the same. But basically, I was a go to for the players. Me and another guy, we tag teamed. Um, so sometimes he well, he most of the time he did all of the like on the road stuff. So he booked to travel. He did all the airplanes, all the hotels, food and stuff. And I would do the in city. So when the players would come back, maybe they need to go to the DMV. Um, and I would tag team with maybe like our security um, guy. His name is Bub. He's amazing. He had all the contacts because he was from Philly. So we would tag team on, you know, the communication. I would pass on the communication. Hey, meet him at this time. Bub would set up the meeting because of his contact. Um, if they were relocating and they needed apartments, we'd have a list of apartments, things that places that players have stayed before. You know, this is the lease um, if you, you know, short term lease or you can get out of it right away because, you know, the athlete's life is so crazy. You can get waived or traded at any moment. Um, game day, I would be in the family room uh, greeting all the families, making sure, you know, everything was being stocked in the family room. If anybody needed anything, I was in charge of the kids room. Um, and I really cultivated a culture there of just family player first. Uh, what I love to do. Um, I like to call it the Shay Dawson experience, mm -hmm. which is giving the best possible human experience that anyone can have when they come in contact with me. So that's part of my also being intentional and just making sure that every relationship is tailored to who those people are and meet them where they're at and not my expectation of them. So that kind of just gave me like my momentum to just, uh, you know, develop all the relationships with the families and just really be the liaison between the team and between the players and their family. So talk about the Shea Dawson experience. Where, where, did, where did you come up with that? So I came up with that because um, I'm always so positive. I'm always happy. Um, and there are times when I'm down, uh, but quickly pick myself back up. But so people started to notice that. And when they would ever have bad days, they would reach out to me and I would w be willingly just to talk to them and just, you know, what's what's going on? You know, how can I figure this out? You know, and they would ask me what I do in order to shake things off or get over things. And I just tell them that I would read. I would even go on the Google and type in exactly what I'm thinking and just try to see if other people are on the same wavelength. Mm -hmm. um, and so I just started realizing that I was duplicating that throughout, you know, my friends would call me for things. My mom would call me for things, my brother, especially. Um, and I started to realize that this was the impact that I had on people. And so I started to be more intentional about that. So maybe being more proactive. So maybe reaching out after we've had a conversation and just checking back in, circling back. Um, and I saw just how much it did for people. And so that's what I wanted to, I wanted to just do that my whole life. So that's kind of what I did with the Sixers. I do that with my family. I do it with my friends. So it's, it's kind of like a, it's kind of like a joke, but it's really not. It's no, like it's my really just not. intentional of being great, a great friend, a great support system, a great resource for other people. It's kind of what it is. Yeah. I mean, I think you being intentional about the experience and, you know, the, the vibe you put out in the world has definitely, uh, has definitely worked out for you. So it's, yeah. it's, it's amazing stuff. I mean, you, you had a chance when you were with the Sixers to work with, with some superstars, right? I think yes. you, you worked with Ben Simmons, Joel Embiid, Jimmy Butler, 
Uh, love them. T- talk a little bit about some of the things you learned working with them. For for somebody who's never had any experience working with NBA players or stars, to be for that matter, can you speak to what that's like? Some of the things you learned, some of the challenges you may have had. Yeah. So I think growing up and helping to raise a brother. Uh, really put me in the mindset and and so a brother also playing basketball and then also trying to get to the next level. Um, so I saw that there was a blueprint there just in terms of all the things that they're going to experience. So I kind of just turned that hat on once I got to the league and say, well, what are all the challenges that Malcolm faced? And I kind of applied that to how I related to the players. So when that comes to schedule, when that comes to, you know, all the games that they play and how they take care of their bodies, try to encourage them to make sure they go to the training room and get ice. Um, you know, if they have a girlfriend or a wife to try to make sure I support them from the back end so that they don't have to do everything or think about things and only think about basketball. But working with stars like Ben Simmons, like Joel Embiid, um, like Markel Fultz, like every like all the guys that I worked with, um, Landry Shamit basically just realizing that they're just people, Mm -hmm. they're humans. They love, love, they love to be supported. They love to support you and just being genuine when you're around them and being who you are really is all you have to do. Um, and just making sure, you know, you're just one step ahead. You're watching the things that they eat. And if you see something cool, you know, I used to like buy little random things on their birthdays that they like, um, you know, just connecting with them on, on different levels and just other than sports, um, really just helped the morale. I think they were kind of like brothers to me, you know, and we would, I would always try to go out with them at least two times a year just to show that like, you know, I'm cool and that I, I'm still hip and that even <laughs> though, you know, I'm in this leadership space, you know, I still have time for play. Um, and they love that too. So it, it has been really great to a really good experience. And you were there for two or three years, three, three years, three years, three years. And then recently you left. Yes. So what was, what was that like? Cause I know the working for the Sixers was your dream job or at least your dream was, at the time. How, it, first of all, it was the most amazing experience ever. And I'm so happy that I picked up and left California to come to Philly to do it. Um, I'd say the first year was a really uh, a hard learning curve just because the NBA is so fast paced, mm-hmm. but it was so exhilarating and so exciting because not every day was the same. You know, um, also getting to experience like the NBA lifestyle, flying on chartered planes, not having to buckle my seatbelt when the plane takes off (laughs) and, you know, stow my laptop or anything and realizing like, wow, this is this is a different world, you know, snacks galore, uh, you know, space. Um, So getting to go to all star games and, and getting to watch players dreams play out was amazing seeing them you know on that all-star floor with the other you know big powers in the league was amazing my colleagues were so positive and so fun you know from PR guys like Patrick Reese who I love talking to every day uh sitting with Elton Brand and talking about players and how we can help them at the next level and 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 in their life I mean I literally it literally was a dream come true Um, But the reason why I left the NBA was because I couldn't work with grassroots players, like players, like younger players. And so that was also a passion of mine. And um, I just felt like we would get players and then they would go. And then I didn't keep in contact with them anymore. And I wanted to be in a position where I don't ever have to leave a player or ever have to like lose contact with a player. And not that I couldn't reach out to them, but my main priority were the Sixers players. And I want to focus on every player that's ever come in contact with me. And I want to cultivate the relationship. I want to be a resource once the ball stops bouncing. Um, I just, I just want to help players in so much more, um, or I guess in a bigger space than just with the team, if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. And so you ended up with overtime. Yes. If you can talk a little bit about what overtime does and what your current role is there. Yeah. So overtime, uh, at first I didn't really know what it was, but they were working with my younger God brother. His name's Mikey Williams. Uh, 
I guess you could say he's like a phenomenon uh, at a young age, which is really cool to see him uh, blossom and grow. So he had a huge following on social media and over time it reached out to him to go to something called the takeover, the overtime takeover that took place in Brooklyn, New York. Uh, so I took a train up during the season. I think the players were away or the team was away and uh, got to go experience this from a family standpoint, not, you know, finally working at an event, I was actually able to enjoy it, which was nice. And I was taking mental notes, just watching how they interacted with the players. They interacted with the families. And it was a, an event that not only catered to the players, both girls and boys. Um, and they were very consistent with both men and or boys and girls, which is really cool to see. Like there was no drop off. There was equally, you know, attentive and they had gear and it was just really cool. And then the parents also had an element that they felt really included, which doesn't really happen when you have events. Cause usually the talent is the main, uh, you know, the main event. And the parents were also included in that as well, which happened to be me because I was on the family side of it. Uh, so they had buses for us to take to the different events that they had over the weekend. They had a uh, meal, like they give us meal tickets to like really eat. They had a happy hour where the parents could go outside and kind of have a cocktail or two while the players were inside playing and they could talk to each other about best practices, you know, about training sessions, about, you know, do they believe in cryotherapy? Like they, we just talked about all these things and, you know, as a person who loves to provide an experience for people, it was really refreshing to see. And also that, you know, I found out that David Stern was an investor, that KD was an investor. So not only w were they working with young talent, they were also working with, um, you know, guys um, in the league and people who were very influential in the NBA and also in the grassroots. Uh, so I thought, wow, that's very cool to have all of this under one roof. Um, and so that's what made overtime attractive to me. And so uh, I was talking to uh, some, I was talking to the founder outside, him and his wife were talking about their kid. I think he's going to Princeton. I uh, hope I got that right. Yeah. Um, and we were talking about, you know, him just going to school and how he's getting ready. And we were just connecting on a level. And my, my founder um, and CEO, Dan Porter, he uh, was president of Teacher for America. So I was like, he is the founder of this company. And also Zach is the co-founder. Um, they really, really thought about children. They really thought about kids and how to help them and how to create a positive platform for them. And so I thought, wow, so what I learned from the NBA and what they're doing here, I thought these are people I could really work with and, and see myself growing with. Um, and even though I didn't express that, you know, this is something I thought was really cool. I went back and I kind of just thought about it. And then, um, I reached out to, my godfather. And he said, you know, you should probably send your resume to overtime. You know, you're really qualified. And so I did that. And then they called me back and said, I, I think there's a way we can work together. Your resume is really impressive. Um, and then after that, I had said, you know what, I'm just going to create my own position. So I basically created my own position. <laughs> Love that. And, uh, and, uh, from based on what I learned from the NBA and things I've learned from the grassroots world before that. And I realized that players need people to help them figure things out. And so over time would put on these events. So I was wondering if there was anybody following up with the players after the event. And so I said, that's going to be me. And so that's when I created the, my, my title is director of athlete and community relations. So kind of just putting, uh, the bow, on major projects that we do and kind of make sure cultivating the relationship, staying involved in those players' lives that we work with, uh, showing up to graduations and showing up to, uh, you know, cool events that they have that maybe they're putting on or they want to sponsor something in the community that we're a part of that, not just their, um, you know, one time. Good for you. Now that sounds like yeah. that's an amazing story. Uh, let me ask you what, you've been there for three months now? I've been there, uh, let's say I started September 3rd. Okay. I started September 3rd, yeah. What are some of the things that you've learned from the company? Wow, so many things. So what I learned from them is that work should be fun, even though it's hard. I think you can have both. I think you should have both because it challenges you, but you also should love the work that you're doing and love the people that you're working with. And over time's culture 
it's an inclusive culture. It's a laid back culture, but it's a grind culture. Mm -hmm. So even though there's a weekend, we're all still working and emailing each other, but we love what we're doing and we're really devoted to it and committed to it. And that's what I love. It's like, even if you have to work on the weekends, it shouldn't feel like work and it, and it doesn't feel like work. And a lot of these events, right. Where, I mean, overtime's essentially a, an event and content company, right? Mm -hmm. A lot of these events are taking place over the weekends, you know, yeah. so for, for all you sports business hopefuls, don't think that, uh, sports is definitely not a nine to five Monday through Friday thing. Definitely not. <laughs> so I want to, I want to shift gears a little bit here. Sure. Um, uh, as somebody who's watched your career from afar, um, I've loved what I've been seeing lately on your LinkedIn profile, as far as your Shea hacks go. What motivated you to start writing these? Because I didn't have anyone I could go to really for advice. Um, well, I did, but I don't know if I was comfortable enough to share where I was at at the moment. Um, maybe embarrassed to just express that I was having these thoughts. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that sometimes through social media, people that can think that you have it all together. Um, you know, when they see you doing cool things, but even though that I was experiencing cool things, there were a lot of things that I wanted to do that I didn't know how. And so a lot of these questions came from me going through situations and then figuring it out and then reverse engineering to try and help other people. Um, so I think that's where they came from. It's just being like, well, I wish I had this kind of resource. I wish I had that information when I was going through that thing I was going through. Can we go through some of them? Sure. Let's go. So Shay hack number two was don't be so afraid of other people's judgment about your current situation that you block your blessings. That fear of what other people might think about you is what's holding you back from forward momentum. Can you speak to that a little bit? Yeah. So I think when I wrote that, I was in the mind space or in the head space of um, being that 30 year old intern and thinking that people would judge me for uh, taking a step back and being an intern, although I've been a head coach and I've been an associate head coach at the high school level. And I've worked with, you know, these major athletes, you know, maybe on the grassroots level and thinking that I'm afraid to do this, but if I don't do this, I'm not going to grow. And so not letting that fear uh, cripple me and just to say yes and do it anyway. And uh, I think when I, now notice when I feel that uncomfortable feeling, that's when I know I'm close to something great. Um, and so don't be afraid to dive into that feeling and really go after it because what else can happen? You, what you say the same. So I kind of, I think that's where I can where it came from. Yeah, it's absolutely brilliant. And I think for those of you that are listening, I mean, the truth of the matter is, is for you to get into sports and to succeed in sports, you're going to have to take chances. You're going to have to put yourself in uncomfortable situations. And, you know, this we're early on in the podcast here, but that has really been the theme for all of our guests thus far, right? Is they all took yeah. chances. They all did things that were uncomfortable. They all grinded it out. But at the end of the day, there's there's light at the end of the road and, and dreams do come true as you've have you, as you've shown us. Yeah. And in sports, you're going to have to take a pay cut. Mm -hmm. You're going to have to relocate if necessary, you're going to have to work for free sometimes just to get the experience versus getting the monetary benefits. Um, you're going to have to possibly take a step down from a title you're used to, to get your foot in the door. And these are all things that I've learned through the process, but being on that ground floor and being at the intern level was the best possible experience because you also gain the respect of people who are maybe, um, you know, in higher positions than you, but have the ability to help you and reach down and pull you up. Um, but if you have no ego and your intention is clear, then it doesn't really matter where you start. It only matters where you're finishing, where you're going. So no question, which leads into Shea hack number four, which I kind of see as a find your why type Shea hack and I'll read it and I'd love for you to, to expand upon it. But it, it, it reads, set your intentions early for your career, literally from the beginning. As soon as you graduate college and you're thinking of entering the workforce, say, self, I would like to work in insert industry because I see myself helping. I promise to take the necessary steps to gain the knowledge and acquire the relationships needed to grow and earn my stripes. 
I love this because finding your why and finding your passion is so important for people who, for sports business hopefuls, because like we've talked about and like the discussion has gone with every guest that's been on the show, if you don't know your why and you're not passionate about what it is that you're doing, then the truth of the matter is, is that there are people out there who will outwork you, right? Because knowing your why is what's going to get you through the hard times. But I'd, I'd love to hear more about what, what this hack means to you. Yeah. So like I said, my why started with uh, helping my brother. Um, a lot of obviously basketball players, people, guys in the NBA come from the black community. And a lot of the times basketball is a way to um, really achieve, achieve success, financial success and, you know, notoriety. And so I realized that players, they get to the NBA or they get some kind of success in basketball. And sometimes you either get hurt or things don't work out as planned. Maybe you go to a bunch of different teams and they deal with a lot of things mentally, you know, socially and emotionally. And seeing this from the back end, I was like, I got, I got to figure this out. I got to help these guys. And so when I say, what's your why, that's my why. So although I'm working with athletes, I'm not working with athletes just to work with athletes. I'm working with athletes to provide some kind of resource when things aren't going the way they expected it to. Um, and so it really, really gives me passion to learn more about the industry and how it works and why things are happening the way they happen when players get weight, uh, traded or waived, you know, what they're going to experience, what kind of emotions, what kind of things are they going to have to put in place, uh, from one team to the next, what are their parents are going to have to do? Some of them have families and kids that they have to like literally pack up overnight and move. Um, and I couldn't imagine someone with a regular job doing that, you know what I mean? So, and it's already hard to just do it, you know, with some time. So if you don't have any time, I thought, dang, that's, that's gotta be stressful. I got to figure this out. And I, and I have what's called the inside out model. And the inside out model is being able to infiltrate a, um, a industry, which is like the grassroots world. I worked there. So I learned how to do that. I learned what went into it so that I could advise players on how to, you know, how to do it, which ones to go to and how to gain, you know, the most success from that. And then also, you know, working in the NBA, learning how the NBA works and why things happen the way they happen and how to help players maneuver when they do happen. So one thing that's for sure is that things are going to, you know, change. Nothing's going to be permanent. You're not going to be on that team forever. Um, and when you get, when you get called or when you get, um, traded or waived, like, what are you going to do? How are you going to figure that out? So I couldn't, help them if I didn't know how to do it or I didn't, I haven't been through it before. So that was one of the reasons why I wanted to be in the NBA, um, to help advise players. And that was my main goal. It wasn't just to be in the NBA, but it was just to help players maneuver, um, outside of the actual business of sports. Now, did you always know what your why was, or is this something that you found out over time? So I'll say that it was happening to me, but I didn't know that that was my why. So I didn't know that was my why until I was more intentional about my living and intentional about what I was trying to do with other people. So when I look back on my life, I would say, well, when I was in high school, I wasn't the most studious person in terms of academics. Like I did the bare minimum because I was always concerned about everyone else. So while people were like at study hours and doing all that, I was trying to figure out which person was eating alone at lunch or if there was somebody being bullied, how could I help uh, provide a better experience for them in school? So I spent my time in hallways eating with people or I spent my time. So in my high school, it was split up between the jocks. So like, you know, basketball players, volleyball players, but the best of the best athletes. And so that was like a mixed crowd. That was Asian, black, white, um, you know, Hispanic, whatever. But then there was also, it was, it was clicked up in different um, races and ethnicities as well. Um, and so I would spend my time going from different uh, circumstances, circumstance. So like in the front, we'd have our cool Asians who, you know, dressed really well and were on the drill team and, you know, had nice cars and drove to school. And then in the middle, you had like maybe your all your kids that were bust in. So obviously most of the black kids. <laughs> um, and then you had uh, 
towards the middle, you had your surfer people, you know, your kids who were in the residential intro area and the suburbs. And so I spent my time going from each section because I was a person that was loving everybody. I always, I always hung out with everybody. I wasn't, I didn't uh, see myself with one crowd, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of was my focus. So when I thought about my life, I was like, you've been doing that your whole life. You've been, you've been that person to people your whole life. Um, and so that's when I was like, wow, this is what I have to do with every single person I come in contact with. And my brother, he needed me, right? We didn't grow up with a father. So I knew he needed me. So I was like, let me take all those things that I've learned and pour it into him so that he can achieve his goals. Because if I help him get to where he needs to, then eventually I'll find my way as well. So that's kind of how I looked at it. I love that. Now I want to get back to something you said a little bit earlier. You mentioned just being intentional, right? Being intentional and really being open to, to answers as far as your why and your passion. Are there any, do you have any rituals or exercises that you could recommend or what, what, what's your process like as far as being intentional goes? Um, so I spent a lot of time on YouTube mm -hmm. <laughs> and I spent a lot of time on podcasts, uh, trying to understand life and how people, uh, are, I guess, interacting with it, what kind of human experiences people are having and how I can add to that. So I think just filling my mind with positive things and educating myself about people and about relationships, about, um, what makes people tick, what makes people, um, sad, what makes people happy, what makes people fear love or, uh, be pulled towards it. I spent a lot of my time researching. I have a ton of books, psychology books. Um, I met George Raveling, uh, last year or year before, I think last year, mm -hmm. I want to say last year I went to, and this was about me being intentional. So I, a friend hit me up and said, Hey, Shay, there's this thing going on. Uh, George Raveling's going to be speaking at it. You should go. So I had a lot to do, but instead of me saying no, and I had a lot to do, I said, I'm going to go. So I drove to New Jersey to Rowan College and I heard him speak and I wasn't planning on meeting him, but I was just in the back. I literally was in the back. I, I walked in, I stood up in the back. I didn't want to sit down because I, I didn't know anybody. Um, but afterwards, everything cleared out and my friend was still there and he was like, you know what? You should come to the happy hour with me. So I went to the cocktail hour cocktail hour. Um, and next thing you know, I ended up talking to George Raveling and talking about my passions about helping athletes and about helping people in general and how I had the Shay Dawson experience. And he loved that. And so, um, he ended up getting my number. I forget what the guy's name is, but, um, he, this guy gave him my number who I had met there as well. We had, we were networking and he's like, you know, George talked about you, uh, the next day. And, you know, I gave him your information. Uh, you should reach out to him sometime. So I, you know, I reached out to him. I sent him an email just saying, so nice to meet you. Heard a lot about you. And he also owns the, um, I have a dream speech, mm -hmm. uh, which is so admirable. And I love that. And how he came about that was crazy. Um, you know, he didn't intend on doing it, but he showed up to the event to work, which is another reason I'm like, this guy I need to know because that's kind of how I am. So he showed up to, um, to hear Martin Luther King, uh, speak. And next thing you know, he ended up asking for that paper and now he's the owner of it. So that was about him being intentional and just showing up. And part of the battle is just showing up to places and then you never know who you can meet. But if you go with the intention of just being there and, and consuming knowledge, it usually always turns out great. So anyway, meet George Raveling and, uh, got on his, uh, email list, started sending me books and every book he sent me literally was, a game changer. Um, and I think I have a few here that I could share. Yeah, please do. Um, yeah. So one was called trailblazer, a pioneer journalist fight to make the media look more like America. And it's, uh, about, um, it's about a black woman. Um, it's her, it's her memoirs, uh, at the Washington post. And her name is Dorothy Butler Gillum. So that one's pretty awesome. Obviously, he sent me a uh, Coach Wooden one on one. Um, what else? I think this one is on the come up by Angie Thomas. Um, so many great books. 
He also sent me a psychology book. Um, that was my favorite one. And I don't, I don't have that here with me, but that was an amazing book. So he started to send me like coaching emails, um, and just really, really being a driving force and inspiring me. And I would, I would reach out to him when I was going through some things. Um, but I would also just, I had great guys in my corner, great people in my corner, um, to finally just help me to lead me into the right path. So being intentional about my relationships and making sure I'm emailing back and forth, making sure I'm texting and following up, um, and just putting good positive things out there. Yeah. So for those of you who don't know who George Ravling is, Coach Rav, he is an absolute living legend. He's 82 years old now and still going very, very strong. Honestly, probably at works. Most of the people listening on listening to this podcast, but, uh, He's the former director of international basketball for Nike. He possesses um, Dr. King's I Have a Dream speech, as Shay said. He was the first African-American basketball coach in the Pac-8. He played a crucial role in having Michael Jordan sign with Nike. The man reads four books a month. He's spoken before Congress. He's got this website and this platform, um, Coaching for Success, that you can go check out on CoachGeorgeRaveling.com. And he also just released the Daily Coach, which is a phenomenal platform for anybody who's out there who wants to get better every day. So this is a man that has absolutely played a crucial role in my development as a person and has really opened my eyes as to, you know, what's out there and what's possible. So like I said, after this podcast, highly, highly recommend that everybody listening Go take the time, go sign up for his newsletters, go sign up, go follow him on, on social and really take to heart what the man has to say, because he is an absolute living legend. Yes. Yes. So it sounds like coach Rav is, is, is one of your mentors. Do you have any other mentors or champions that, uh, have helped, you know, shape you into who you are today? Oh my God. So champions is the name of the game. Mentors. Great. But mentors usually are there for you, give you advice, um, kind of, you know, when you have a specific question, but champions are people who actually invite you into the rooms you're not normally um, privy to be in. And yes, I have a lot of champions. Uh, I have Lee Klein, five-star basketball, uh, his, his dad, uh, Alan Klein, his, they started five-star basketball and that's the first time. I actually had my first uh, sports job and when I knew I loved uh, basketball operations, Gary Charles, Gary Charles is the CEO and founder of, um, big time, big time hoops, but he also, or previously known as uh, fab 48. Um, I'd say my godfather, Malon Williams, he definitely has put me in a ton of positions to be successful and put me in rooms. Um, I, like I said before, my friend Lerone Fanon, she always, whenever we're in, um, at parties or anything, she always hypes me up. She always gives my credentials when we meet people, which is so awesome because it's so important to do that for people because a lot of the times you don't have time to, um, you know, get to know them yourself. But if somebody says, Hey, this is Shay, my girl, Shay, she's really passionate about basketball. Her brother's Malcolm Thomas, who also played at San Diego state with Kawhi Leonard, Billy, you know, white, and just starts giving you the whole credentials and just her background. She worked for the Sixers. Then people say, Oh, that's great. And then they start talking about things that they can relate to with you. And then that gives you a foot in the door Mm -hmm. and automatically their credibility. It literally comes on to you and, people look at you as somebody that has already been vetted and that they can trust. Um, and so that's a huge, huge step in championing. I have so many more Brandon Williams who gave me my first start in the NBA, Elton brand, who uh, has been a mentor to me. Um, Todd Wright, who, um, is now the VP of, um, I I don't know his exact title, but he's with the Clippers. I want to say VP, uh, let me look it up. Oh, yeah. So Todd is the uh, assistant coach and vice president of player performance with the Clippers. Now he was with me at the Sixers. He's been a huge, huge, huge part of my um, transition, just giving me advice and just being there for me. Um, I also when I interviewed with uh, the Minnesota Timberwolves, uh, he helped put in a good word for me. So things like that 
are super, super huge. Um, I, I, I know I'm forgetting so many people. There's so many people who have leaned in for me. You, uh, Warren Legary, of course, who am I talking about? Um, Albert, oh my God, like amazing people who have helped me just really, really inspired me, but also just put me in front of people and said, Shay is the best and you need to work with her. Um, so many, so many people. What, what advice would you and give? And if I forgot you, you know who you are. Yeah, <laughs> yeah there, there's a lot of them out there. A lot, lot of, yes. a lot of Shay Dawson experience fans. That's for sure. <laughs> what, what advice would you give our listeners as far as finding a champion or developing champions or even mentors? Well, I would say that first, like, I get a lot of messages on LinkedIn um, from my Shay hacks, from my different posts. And I don't get to, I don't, I'm not close with every single person, but people who just reach out and say, Hey, Shay, um, loved your post. Uh, really just love to, I'm watching you, you know, just kind of in an organic way, just develop a relationship. And then you know what they follow up with me. They, so if, if I give them some advice, you know, they'll say, Hey, you know what? Just uh, send you a message. I actually got that internship, you know, with the diamondbacks. I really appreciate you taking the time to give me some inspiration and just to tell me that I'm, I'm, I'm working hard and I'm still on the right path. Um, and then, you know, since they followed up with me, I'll follow back up with them. It becomes an organic thing. They're not really asking me for anything, but they're kind of just letting me know what they are in their life. And if I have any input, um, I'd say how I found my champions, it's just being an over, overly um, communicative person, just being like, hey, my name is Shay. Uh, you know, how can I help? Just can I be an assistance? I don't want anything. I just want the experience. And then showing that I, you know, have that initiative and I'm not really looking for anything in return has really helped me so much um, because I really just want to connect with people. And then if it goes further, great. If not, I, I've gained a friend or I've gained somebody who, who knows uh, exactly who I am and I don't need to put on a front or anything like that. So I'd say build organic relationships, show up to events. Uh, you know, part of the problem or part of the, the solution is just showing up showing up to events and letting people know who you are and not being afraid to give your credentials, even if you don't have any, like, you know, you can always talk about what you want to be and what you want to do versus what you're doing now. A lot of people don't show up because they're not actively doing anything that they think is qualified. But I think just showing up and letting people know what you want to do and putting that out in the universe. Uh, and then when people you meet, um, know that about you, when they go back to their perspective, um, jobs or careers and something comes available, you'll be the first of mine because you had told them what you wanted to do and they would can associate that passion, you know, with what they're trying to help you do. And a lot of people want to help. So it's just a matter of telling people what you want. Absolutely. You, you said one thing just now that, that, that brought a thought to my mind. One of the hashtags that you use pretty often on LinkedIn is hashtag servant leader. And this is also in the title of George Raveling's LinkedIn uh, profile. What what does servant yes. leadership mean to you? Oh, man. So I've learned a lot about leadership in the different industries I've worked in. And I realize that any leader, and especially a servant leader, um, people don't work for you. You work for them. Um, and so that's the kind of leader I am. I and working every day for the people around me. Um, they're giving me the fuel to continue to do what I'm doing just in terms of connecting with people. And, you know, the main goal of a servant leader is to serve. It's not to gain notoriety for things. It's just to be on the back end, pushing people upward, um, you know, or just constantly filling people with positive things and understanding that traditional leadership is great, but, the leaders I've had like Warren and Albert and you guys at summer league is that you guys always preach. There's no ego. So although Albert and Warren and you guys are running this major operation, I never felt like you were better than me. I never felt like you said you were better than me. You were like, if I'm picking up trash, you guys can pick up trash. If I'm escorting people, you know, to a, a faraway place, you can do the same thing. Um, and so I've taken that from a lot of people over time and, and the removing the ego thing at summer league that really stuck with me. Um, and that's kind of the way I operate now. I don't have an ego when I am working with people, I'm willing to do whatever job possible to get the end result done. 
Um, it has nothing to do with title. It has nothing to do with, uh, you know, tenure, nothing. I think that just being a servant leader is your, your main goal is to serve those in your, in your area, in your, in your space. And do whatever it takes. And do whatever it takes because the end goal should be about people. It should be a community. It shouldn't be, I'm this person and I'm dictating to you. It should not be like that. Collaboration over competition. That's what I like to say. No question. So Shay, you're, you're so positive. You have this amazing energy. You've created the, the Shay Dawson experience. You've had these amazing, amazing jobs. One of the things that I try to do here on the podcast is humanize our guests. Is there anything that you struggle with? Oh, so I, I, I think I'm an empath. I've looked up the definition so many times. Um, and I think it's just... I take on people's um, energies. Mm -hmm. And so I struggle when I'm around people that have, um, have been through something that maybe they're not able to pull themselves up through. So sometimes I spread myself too thin. I try to help everybody and sometimes it's just not possible. Uh, you have to be aware that when you're trying to help people, they want to help themselves. Um, so I think I struggle with sometimes taking on too much and then I ended up, I end up uh, taking on too much emotion and not all brought on by myself. And sometimes, um, you know, I, I could be low energy, uh, and, and for people that need me, I don't, I don't think that's good sometimes. So I have to be aware of where I focus my energy, um, and how I help people so that I'm at my best all the time. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. So we're getting towards the end of our time here. Um, I'm going to ask some rapid fire questions. The answers don't have to be quick answers though. What advice would you give to your 20 year old self? Uh, try everything, try everything, go everywhere. Uh, don't put limits on yourself. Uh, yeah, just be free spirited and, uh, try everything meaning in a good way, like try all the different types of jobs. Don't, don't, uh, box yourself in and say, Oh, I only want to do this because you never know who you can meet in those spaces that, uh, will bring everything full circle. So try everything, go everywhere, um, within the scope of ob obviously positive energy, uh, and, and gaining experiences. What is the, the book podcast or video that has impacted you the most and why? Uh, Gary Zukoff. Uh, see the soul. Um, Oprah had him as a guest. I watch that video on YouTube often to be reminded um, to be intentional about my life and about my relationships. And once I started to be intentional, everything changed for me. And I'd say Gary Zukov and Oprah Winfrey, shout out to you guys. When you think of the word successful, who's the first person who comes to mind and why? My mom. Uh, my mom didn't go to college or didn't finish college. She moved from a small town in Columbia, Missouri to San Diego, California to be with her best friend who was in the Navy at the time uh, because she wanted a better situation for my brother and I. And I know some people associate uh, jobs and education with being successful, but I think uh, a, ma a single mom raising two kids on her own to be positive people, loving people, people who are out here in the world, uh, you know, trying to make a difference. My brother plays overseas. He played in the NBA for a little while. Um, I'm currently going through different shifts in my career, but I think I'm pretty successful in my own right with just trying to, um, help everybody. And I think her being able to produce two people like that, I think that's success. Absolutely. Um, do you have any requests or asks of the audience? Um, to be kind to people, uh, to go the extra mile for people. Um, I don't know why I'm getting emotional, but, um, just, it's not about us, you know, individuals. It's about helping other people and, um, connecting with each other. I think the state of the world today sometimes makes me sad because it seems so divided, but we can do more together. Uh, so just be a good person, uh, have empathy, 
try to be put yourself in someone else's shoes, have compassion and uh, try to learn from people who aren't the same as you, whether that's religion, whether that's, uh, you know, uh, politics, any of that. I, I think that we all can learn something from each other. So just try to work together and you can accomplish more together. You go faster together. So Shay, thank you so much. This has been amazing. I'm sure people are going to get so much out of this episode. Can't tell you how much we appreciate your time and hope we can do uh, round number two sometime soon. Sergio, thank you so much. I hope I said things that were positive and helpful. It's so crazy because I have so much to say and I guess doing this more, I'll be able to uh, funnel it more. But uh, yeah, I really appreciate it. Thanks for coming on. All right. And there you have it, my friends. I hope you enjoyed this interview with the one and only Shay Dawson. If you learned anything or inspired by the show, please make sure to share with your friends, post it on social media, and subscribe and review. You can find the show notes for everything that was discussed on the show at sportsbusinessclassroom.com forward slash Shay Dawson. That's S H E A D A W S O N. If you are enjoying the show, Please let us know you're listening, share it with your friends, and help us spread the message of getting better each and every day. One more big thank you to our sponsors, Sports Business Classroom Online and Hall Pass Media, and thanks again for listening. We will see you next week on the Sports Business Classroom audio experience.